Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar on patient and clinician involvement in the EU health technology assessment regulation. My name is Monika Rakovica, Access and Policy Manager, Myeloma Patient Europe. Um, and today's agenda will include uh, first a short overview of key elements of the UHTA regulation provided by Anke Peggy Holtorf from Health Technology Assessment International, followed by a panel discussion with Q&A sessions moderated by Anke with panelists François Huyes from Eurordis, Mihai Rotaru from FPA, Iriana Huyk, uh, HTA Independent Specialist Croatia, and Robin, uh, Robin uh, this week from EHA. And we're aim to um, wrap up and close the webinar at 4.30. Uh, first, a few um, words about organizers. Myeloma Patients Europe, um, it's an umbrella organization with 52 myeloma and AL amyloidosis patient groups across Europe. Um, and Acute Leukemia Advocates Network is an independent global network of patient organizations dedicated to changing outcomes um, of patients with acute leukemia by strengthening patient advocacy. And you can read more about both organizations on the respective web pages provided here. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before we start. Um, the Q&A sessions will follow discussion after each key theme. Uh, more detail about the key themes we provide the later um, in the webinar. Please use the Q&A window to write a question and the moderator will ask it on your behalf. Um, the Q&A button is found on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window, as you can see in the, the image. You can also click on the like button to upvote questions. Uh, that way we will know um, if you um, support um, particular questions. Uh, you will be able to see and hear uh, the presenters, myself, Anke, uh, and the other panelists, but you will not be able to see or hear other attendees. Um, if you cannot uh, hear the presenters, uh, please make sure the speakers are not muted, the volume is set high. Um, you can um, use a chat window to chat with other participants or uh, post any other comments. Um, if you're facing any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat function, function and uh, some, someone from the MPE team will reach out to you. Uh, please also note that the webinar is being recorded. It will be available on MPE uh, website and social media channels. Um, going back to today's theme, um, the question of why are we holding uh, this webinar today? Um, the HTA, health technology assessment, is a key part uh, of how new medicines and medical devices reach patients. Um, and improved European collaboration on HTA is important and can potentially improve uh, evidence based and consistent decision making. Uh, the EU HTA regulation is currently in the implementation phase. It will start in 2025, in January 2025, to be more exact, for certain medicines. Um, therefore, um, we think that it's important that patients and patient advocates, as well as clinicians, are informed about the content and progress of the regulation, and in particular, understanding how, um, uh, how and when they can be involved. Um, and without further ado, um, may I introduce uh, Anke Peggy Holtorf, the steering committee member and project coordinator for the patient and citizen involvement in HTA interest group, um, Health Technology Assessment International, to provide us an overview of the HTA regulation. Thank you, Monica. Uh, before I invite uh, the, uh, the rest of the panel for the discussion, I would like to remind everybody about what the EU HTA regulation is. It was adopted in December 21, and then came into force in January 22. Now we are in a phase where they develop all the processes and guidelines around this regulation and how it will be used. And then it will be an application in January uh, 2025 with the first uh, therapeutic areas, oncology and ATMs, and then subsequently extending to other areas. The, there are four main aims of this regulation to improve patient access to innovative technologies, to strengthen the quality of HTA across the European Union, to avoid duplication and ensure efficiency, and to secure the long-term sustainability of EU HTA cooperation. If you go to the next slide. 
Uh, so HTA in general has a range of different domains they look at and which can be uh, divided into a clinical part and a non-clinical part. Now with the new EU regulation, the focus on the uh, will be on the clinical part for the EU uh, um, work and then the non-clinical part will be done on the member state level. <clears throat> the clinical for the clinical part there are several work streams um, uh, working. Uh, one is the joint clinical assessment, then joint scientific consultation, horizon scanning or emerging te health technologies, methodologies and voluntary cooperation for other issues. That's the EU part. The non-EU part is the national level where uh, the other domains are looked at, economic, ethical, social, legal, and then also the conclusions from the assessments will be made and then finally decisions uh, on pricing and reimbursement. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so what, how can patients be involved in, uh, in this, patients and clinicians? They can be involved as part of the stakeholder network uh, in the horizon scanning, so the identification of emerging health technologies, and in the joint scientific consultation. And then patients and clinicians can be involved uh, on invitation, basically, in the joint clinical assessment, uh, and for that, they need to declare their interests and not to have a conflict of interest. They need to sign a confidentiality agreement and follow the data protection rules. In the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the declaration of in interest I made uh, mentioned before. All participants have to declare their interests. That is employment funding, advisory functions, any interactions uh, with pharmaceutical or other healthcare industry, and and also not only from themselves, but also of their partners. This declaration of interest will be reviewed. And then if the commission comes to the conclusion that there is a conflict of interest, the uh, possibility to give input into the HDA will be restricted. And as it seems now, uh, this the rules for this will be very handled very, very strictly. However, if they don't find anybody without a conflict of interest, then they may still involve people who have been determined to have a conflict of interest. Now, in summary, if we go to the next slide, um, I, what has changed with the EU reg regulation? What we see here is what was until now. In each of the member states who did an HTA, uh, they went through this process of topic selection, scoping of the research, evidence submission, reviewing the evidence, having some appraisal committee or uh, uh, other forms and uh, consultation, and then a publication of the report. The question to be answered here was, does the intervention offer useful, appropriate, and affordable benefits for the patients? Now, what's new in the EU process um, is that on the EU level, we will look at the clinical part. Does the intervention offer useful and appropriate benefits for patients? There will be a topic selection, then a scoping phase, that is the definition of the research question to be answered by the HDA, then evidence submission, a review of the evidence, a report which may be put out or will be put out for consultation, and then a final report. The only thing where member states can input into this is through the scoping where they can submit uh, their questions they want to be answered have answered from the HTA um, to the, the central assessment team. Then the report which comes out from the central uh, clinical assessment goes into the countries. They have to review it. Uh, they may ask for additional evidence to be uh, submitted if they don't find things they they would like to see. However, they cannot ask for submission of the same evidence. They will review um, uh, the total of the evidence and then uh, again, a, an appraisal, a consultation phase, a publication, and this report may then be used for decision-making. 
So that is the overview on the old and the new process. And with that, I would like uh, to invite uh, the panel uh, to to the to the screen to say so. Um, as uh, Monica already mentioned, we have here Francois Rouillet from the uh, European Organization for Rare Diseases, Mariano Huick, from his, uh, who is a very experienced independent HDA specialist from Croatia. We have Mihai Rotaru from the European F uh, Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. And then we have uh, Robin Dusweg uh, from the European Hematology Association. Now, um, I'll put out my first question in, in, a, in a second or a few seconds. Uh, I would like to invite each of the panel members to first, before they start to answer the question, to introduce uh, yourself a little bit more in detail and then come back to the questions at the same time, all the participants can submit their questions through the Q&A function. So uh, we've heard about this new process. I went in a very quick hurry through it. Uh, what, what is your opinion? What will be the Im impact of this EU HTA regulation in practice on a European level and then on a country level? And, and how can you, from your perspective, influence this this and make it even more impactful? Maybe we start with, with Mariana and then the others. Yes, hello to all. Uh, my name is Mirjana Huic. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, a specialist in clinical pharmacology and toxicology. And I'm working uh, in the last 15 years as a HDA specialist. Uh, at national and the uh, last uh, four years at uh, mainly and in, uh, international level. So uh, from the HDA perspective, uh, I think uh, um, it will be a huge positive impact uh, of this regulation at European and also at a national level, because we will pull uh, HTA uh, experts. Uh, we will pull. Uh, we will have this uh, pooled uh, HTA expertise. We will avoid duplication related to this uh, clinical uh, assessment. Uh, at the same time, uh, we will have. Uh, we will use this uh, joint uh, clinical assessment report in a national processes, and automatically uh, our process will be faster. Uh, uh, of high quality. We will also have a sustainable national HDA process. And of course, the number of uh, HDA reports, national HDA reports uh, will uh, rise and uh, will, uh, will be available at a timely manner for our national decision makers. Uh, this will automatically, um, I think, uh, um, supported uh, our decision makers with uh, timely high quality HDA reports and uh, they uh, could uh, make uh, faster and evidence-based uh, decision making on innovative health technologies uh, but also I must point it that uh, this will also depend on the, the health technology developer because uh, for the national process, it, it is very important that the health technology developer manufacturers ask for reimbursement process. When they ask for reimbursement process, then, for example, National Health Insurance Fund ask a national HTA body to provide the national HTA report based on joint uh, clinical report to add some uh, uh, national uh, data, for example, epidemiological data or uh, 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 cause data, uh, uh, economic analysis, and also for medical devices, very important organizational data. So this is uh, really important. If we uh, uh, have uh, this, uh, a faster access to the innovative uh, medicine uh, and medical devices, 
at the national level, but also at the European level, because uh, there are still a huge differences and delay between Western European country and uh, uh, so-called uh, CE countries, uh, Central Eastern European countries, and patients are really delayed with the uh, innovative health technology, unfortunately. And with this regulation, I hope uh, this will... Uh, inequities uh, will appear and uh, we will have faster access for all patients. Thank you. Thank you, Miliana. Uh, so in summary, like what I hear your expectation is especially for the uh, Eastern European countries, uh, more equity, uh, faster processes if the health Technology developers uh, ask timely for for price uh, for prices and reimbursement. So let's ask the representative of the health technology developers to uh, to give his mm -hmm. perspective. Thank you very much, Anke. I'm going to assume you meant me. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Miharo Taro. Uh, as Anke mentioned, I work for FPS, so the European Association representative representing the R&D pharma industry in Europe. Um, I work primarily on the implementation of the HTA regulation, but I also have a few other mar market access files when it comes to oncology policy, biosimilars, and a few other things. I would I would say right off the bat that uh, we fully subscribe to to the objectives and the expectations and the hopes of Mariana. Um, that's exactly how we have seen the implant the HTA regulation as an opportunity. Uh, for for broader and improved patient access and also faster patient access at European level. What I would add to what to everything that Mariana said is that the HTA regulation also provides an opportunity for Europe to do more together. And by that, I mean both in terms of outlining evidence requirements and expectations, but also their assessments. And that's important also as an opportunity for companies because as we all know, Evidence generation is global, but decisions are local. But evidence generation being global, they, the companies tend to uh, develop their global clinical development plans according to some key or to a few key requirements. Obviously, and you know this very well, there are certain trade offs involved in how these decisions are made. And that's where the HDA regulation can enable member states to join hands and to come together and outline their specific expectations from how from HDDs about how evidence should be should be developed but that also requires a compromise to be found because and i think you've all heard uh, various examples in the public domain and we'll come to this in a second about the number of picos that can be expected it's very very hard to imagine that uh, there will be clinical trials that will de be developed using seven or eight comparators, which is quite a, a conservative number of comparators that we see being asked in, in a simulating in a simulated environment currently by, by member states. So member states need to come together to compromise and to streamline what, what they ask of, HD, of HDDs in order to make that a reality. So that was the, that's the only thing that I would add, but otherwise we are fully behind everything that Mariana said in terms of expectations and, uh, and uh, hope for the, the future system. Thank you, Mihai. Yeah, you uh, opened already a little bit the, 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 the can of uh, uh, difficulties or challenge, challenges in that. We'll, we'll definitely come back to that subject. Uh, but before we do so, I'd like to in, invite the two stakeholder representatives, maybe first Francois from the patient perspective and then Robin uh, from the clinical perspective. Thank you, Anke, and hello to everyone. So at Aurordis, we've been working, following up the developments, the efforts, the European efforts to work uh, jointly at the European level uh, in HTA and other domains, but in HTA in particular since 2010, but also analyzing at the national level how decisions are made and how patients are involved. And recently we launched a training program for patient advocates funded by the Commission, UCAPA, precisely to learn how to be involved uh, in the European cooperation. About the European cooperation and its impact, we don't think 
it will have a direct access, a direct impact on access. Access will remain a national decision. And when affordability will be the problem, affordability will remain the problem and the European cooperation will not have an impact on, on that. It may have an impact on the time to access uh, as for medicines, uh, the assessment of the medicines will be conducted in parallel to the CHMP and the clinical elements, the reports will be published sh shortly after the European Commission publishes uh, the decision to authorize a new medicine. And that's important because until now, no member state respected the legal uh, time frame, uh, the 180 days, which is a legal uh, delay, uh, to make uh, the pricing and reimbursement decision. And the European Court of Justice re repeatedly um, concluded that it is a legal obligation to respect this 180 days. So with this report available sooner than before, we are gaining time and it leaves 180 days to the national decision-making to focus on the national context information, to take into account the European report and to finalize the decision to reimburse or, or not. And secondly, it will increase transparency as we will have the European report, which we can use in all member states when, for example, our authorities explain that the medicine is not working, at least we will have this European report uh, to challenge uh, their decisions and say, but what do you base your opinion on? Is really the clinical benefit that is a problem or is it more the affordability or something else and you don't want to say it? That will create a framework for patients and clinicians to engage with their authorities, particularly in countries uh, which haven't been very clear and transparent on how they make this, uh, these decisions. And thirdly, it will align methods uh, bringing together the best experts uh, to assess technologies um, as often uh, observed at the European level, at the EMA and other scientific agencies or, or committees, it is really useful to bring together um, those who are more aware of new methods, innovative methodologies and innovative products and able to assess them jointly is certainly a guarantee uh, that the quality of these assessments will be improved. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Robin Dusweiker of European Affairs at European Hematology Association. We represent uh, hematologists uh, across Europe. Um, I also chair the HTA working group of the Biomed Alliance, an alliance of uh, medical societies across uh, disciplines. Um, I hope um, and to some extent believe that EU HTA will help um, improve access. It will definitely uh, improve, um, at least that's my expectation, decision making based on a more harmonized, um, uh, better, more transparent information basis. Um, that will then be used um, by the member states for their national decision making on added value, uh, prices, reimbursement. And although that um, decision making on on value, on pricing, on reimbursement will remain at the national level. Uh, I am slightly more optimistic than Francois that it will uh, help to improve uh, access to better. I think that's very important to better uh, medicines and and therapies uh, therapies that have real added benefit uh, from a, a patient and clinical perspective. So essentially, uh, the system will provide a level of harmonization directly um, in the at the stage of uh, collecting uh, information, doing the relative clinical benefit assessment, uh, and indirectly in the decision making by the national authorities on uh, on access. Um, of course, the theory, as, as so often, is, is wonderful. Whether this will all uh, work in, in practice uh, will depend on um, uh, several uh, things I, I, we, that we will be discussing in more uh, detail. But importantly, 
um, substantial and structural involvement of both uh, patient experts and patient organizations, as well as clinical experts and, uh, and their uh, medical societies. Um, so I am, I am uh, optimistic that it will uh, improve access. It will definitely make the system more uh, efficient and transparent. Um, I hope, certainly hope, I mean, that otherwise it will fail from our point of view, but I certainly hope that it will prove, improve the equitability of access. I am slightly more concerned about the affordability, but um, ultimately we also hope that it will make the system uh, cheaper and, and, and access cheaper. Thank you. So it's a little, little bit of contradiction here. I hear from Francois that he is afraid that the affordability issue will still be very strong in the countries uh, and that that part uh, may not improve. And you say, yeah, but we have the harmonization of the at least the clinical assessment and therefore uh, the clinical benefit is more clear and, and therefore there's also some, let's say, pressure on the countries uh, to move forward, at least with the better ones. Um, Mayana and Mihai, any responses on the, like what, what we have a little vote here on, on will it improve access or not? Uh, so I'm 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 still positive and and <laughs> I I really expected the uh, the better and faster access because uh, we already, for example, in Croatia have uh, some uh, concrete experience because we were involved uh, very heavily in. Uh, um, UNETA joint action one, uh, two, and three, and uh, we. Uh, were acting as a first author or the uh, co-author of uh, different uh, joint HA reports. And when we were acting as such, uh, um, we see that uh, uh, our national uh, report uh, um, uh, um, are, are provided in a, in a really timely, much faster manner when we use this uh, joint clinical reports. and. Uh, also, when we discuss in a scoping meeting with the industry, uh, we pointed this importance that they need to ask our uh, Croatian Health Insurance Fund for reimbursement process. And they did it, uh, that uh, very fast. So uh, we provided uh, our national report with some uh, adaptation and, and uh, translation in, in uh, Croatian language uh, in uh, less than uh, three weeks and uh, so uh, decision makers uh, made uh, their decision much faster and uh, because there were positive evidence and probably also uh, the negotiation between a uh, health insurance fund and the industry about the, the price and everything uh, uh, was positive. So uh, patient uh, really have access uh, to this medicine uh, really fast. So. Having said that, uh, with uh, positive experience, uh, I really expected uh, um, better access and then uh, that uh, uh, this negotiation of the pricing, which is not, of course, a uh, part of uh, HTA, it's a uh, part of negotiation of, of health insurance fund and industry, uh, will be also uh, faster, better, and uh, that the patient will have a uh, faster access. Thank you. Thank you. And, and me, I. So I would say, Anka, I would say that both Francois and Robin are right at the same <laughs> time. I think we all know that access hurdles, and they're multifactorial. The reasons for, for unavailability and delays are multifactorial. And I think both of them recognize that with the HDA regulation, we're only really looking at a, a, that one sliver of the, of the, the pathway, if you will. Uh, but it is an important one. Um, I would say for me, there's probably multiple ways for how the EHT regulation can contribute. Um, I think Francois is right to point out that sometimes at national level, there are these discussions about whether or not the product works, whether or not the product is better compared to what we have today. I think the EHT regulation could go a long way towards uh, reducing the need for those diverging discussions, which means that there's less time wasted, if you will, in the national procedure. I would also imagine that the HDA regulation could contribute towards a more 
uniform access environment, if you will. By that, I mean that there should be less reasons why access is restricted to subpopulations between different countries. Um, and then I think there's also uh, an important discussion to be had in terms of the, the timing. Obviously, the, the, the pricing and reimbursement and the budget impact are important considerations. And probably the impact of the HTA regulation will be felt differently depending on the country that we're talking about. Maybe in Western European countries, we'll have a more evidence, the, a more discussion about the evidence requirements. Maybe in, in Central and Eastern European countries, we'll have a better opportunity to talk about uh, accelerating the time because then it will be one less step that will need to be completed at national level. And then therefore, normally, normally it should mean that the discussions on, on all the other elements could start earlier and therefore hopefully end earlier as well. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'd like to pull out one other point uh, Francois mentioned, which is the training uh, uh, Eurodis has, has developed together with um, uh, EPF and, and the University of, of Hull. Uh, uh, it's called UCAPA, and everybody, anybody who is interested in that should really look up this training. Maybe uh, Monica uh, can distribute the link afterwards so that people will look into it. There, it's really a, a very good opportunity. There is another training that's developed on the EU level, which is HDA for patients. Uh, so anybody who is interested, look at these opportunities for getting more information. Just a little advertisement here, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I see there is one question from the audience, um, which is uh, what should be the role of the health technology developers during the assessment processes? And would you expect any significant differences between EU legislation and non-EU policies? Um, would anybody like to comment on that? I look at Miljana or Mihai. I'm happy to to start, Anke. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a very good question, but also a very difficult one to answer because the answer involves some delicate trade-offs. We know very well, and we know the expectation from HDA bodies, but also from the healthcare system overall, that the HDA process is independent, that it's scientifically focused. And these are objectives that we, we definitely share. However, we do feel that there's a missed opportunity uh, at European level in the current way the framing of the process is, is foreseen, because at least at the very early stages when the technology is submitted for regulatory approval, normally the HDD is the one that knows the most about the product by virtue of it having developed it for so many years in terms of how the product was developed, developed the clinical trials, the evidence base, the treatment pathways, all of the trade-offs involved in those discussions. And that's a unique perspective that HDDs would be able to contribute in the in the European process. Now, I know that there's there's uh, that's why I'm mentioning that this is a this is a trade-off discussion. Probably people will have a certain affinity for one side of the debate versus another. Uh, I'm not here to 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 make a judgment on that. I'm simply saying that the, the there is still a delicate balance between the independence of the process and making sure that the process takes into account all the relevant evidence and expertise while managing and being transparent about the inputs that went into that process with the respective conflicts. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can just add from my side that in comparison to non-EU policies, that's a very difficult one because there are so many different policies and there. sometimes it's the... Uh, um, the, the scope uh, submitted by the health technology developer, which is taken as a starting point, and sometimes uh, it's uh, it's a mix, it's a discussion which takes place. So that that is really a difficult uh, question to answer in in the short time. Um, there's 
another question coming in here. Uh, actually, it's a few questions. Um, let's wait with that question. Go to our discussion because some of the points uh, might may come back through, through the rest of the discussion here. So. Um, uh, the, the next complex of questions I, I would like to uh, ask uh, is, is around the patient and clinician engagement in, in the um, new EU HDA processes. And uh, maybe I start with Francois. What, what is your perspective on the arrangement for patient expert or patient organization involvement across the EU HTA regulation, as far as we know, because we don't really know everything yet. Um, uh, do you see any red flags, any any positive elements? Yes, certainly there is a willingness to involve patients in these uh, procedures, both the joint scientific consultations, the scientific advice and the assessments themselves. For the assessments, uh, the idea is that patients as experts, we don't know how many, but one, two, will be invited as experts, at least at the beginning, when defining all the questions the developer will have to respond to, the PICOs, not only which patient populations are of interest, but also uh, how to measure the impact of the technology in the daily life of patients. And for, for these discussions, we think that not all lay patients can really contribute. We need patients who are aware of European treatment guidelines when they exist for their disease, not just your own experience, not just your own treatment, but know how other patients with different disease stages are treated and how it differs in different countries, the so-called standard of care, um, diversity in, uh, in our countries, Otherwise, it will be difficult even to understand why different member states propose different PICOs, which sometimes don't make much sense, but they have the right to, to ask them. So we need patients who are quite aware uh, on how patients are treated and different types of patients for, for, for the disease. During the assessment itself, well, it's the assessors who will assess the data submitted by the developer. There isn't much role for the external experts, but towards the end, when a report will be ready, we understand the patients will have a possibility to review that report, but we'll see how it, uh, how it goes. For the organizations, it's less clear. There is no systematic involvement of the patient organizations in these assessments. And we can understand why, because it's really um, a discussion among experts you need to decide and to define, um, to conclude at the end of the meetings. Uh, you cannot have people who need who have to say, oh, I'm sorry, I have to go back to my organization and I will respond to you later. No, it's the collective uh, decision, the collective discussion, which is of importance. Everyone brings his or her own expertise at the meeting. That is why the point of view of organizations are less uh, important in these procedures except that patient organizations ideally uh, could submit data um, that is not provided for for the moment. Um, there could be, in theory, third party contributions to the data submitted by the, to, to, to the HTA cooperation, patient experience data, patient preferences solicitation studies or other surveys conducted by the patient organizations we still need to find when exactly uh, patient organizations could submit, propose the, the data they, they, they have. You, you ask which red, red, red flags. Um, one we can foresee is that not all member states have a tradition or experience in involving patients. And not all member states have the same capacities to become authors or co-authors of such assessment, of such reports. It, we may end up with always the same agencies taking the work on board. And these agencies may have a tendency to consult more patients at the national level and use their procedures to consult patients at the national level and overlook uh, the consultation, the involvement of patients at the European level, or they may 
not have the capacity to identify patients from other countries. So that will be um, an indicator of success, the diversity of the patient population to be invited to contribute to the different procedures. Will it be a club of member states doing business as usual and uh, involving their usual stakeholders? Or will there really be an effort uh, to do something more, more European than, than, than in the past? Um, but clearly, uh, for the patient organizations, this will request to get prepared uh, first to identify experts when they will be invited, but also if they want to submit data, they will need to anticipate um, waiting for a procedure to start will be too late. Uh, the quality, well, the dialogue with the developer um, and the research, um, the quality of the dialogue and of the co-construction of the research with the developer for example, putting a community advisory board will really make the quality of the evidence downstream. So all this will need to be anticipated. And ideally, at the end of the phase two, there should be already uh, among our organizations some plans for some preparatory work to prepare for when the HTA procedure will, uh, will start. Over to you. Thank you, Francois. There's uh, quite a few important points uh, you made. Uh, and uh, Mirjana, I, I would probably ask you in a minute to respond to, to uh, some, some of the fears that were kind of uh, coming up. I'd like to pick up on the, the notion of uh, to have an opportunity to submit experience data, uh, maybe preference data from the patient side. I guess the same would uh, be an expectation from the industry side because they've also developed these kind of data during the uh, during the development process and would like to be able to to submit that. Right, Mihai. I would so we, yes certainly I would come back to to my previous uh, observation that it is a trade off between the the uh, impartiality of the process and the involvement of, of HDD so we 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 do recognize that say our the way we are perceived obviously we have a vested interest in the in the UHD process um, I would say. I, I will be presumptuous and say that patient and clinician involvement is slightly different uh, because they have, let's say, an interest in the in, in in the output of the of the process overall. But it's 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 a slightly different consideration from from uh, the the HDD so from from the HDDs. And I think another point that maybe is important, and we should have mentioned this at the very beginning. The HTA regulation is not a decision-making point. It's not a decision-making process. It is the JCA report is supposed to help facilitate a decision at national level, but it's not a decision in and of itself, which means that there is probably a more latitude to have involvement of other experts and the HTD patients, clinicians, and other experts in the process because it's a it's a yeah, it's a preparatory document. It's a discussion and input collection exercise, if I can be so so bold to call it like that, which facilitates a, de a decision at national level. The decision at national level, as Francois was mentioning, also depends on, on many other factors. And that's obviously at national level, the discussions become a little bit more tense, maybe a little bit more heavy, a little bit more, uh, let's say, challenging. But at, at the European level in the HD process, it sh this shouldn't be as as uh, apocalyptic. Okay, thank you. Uh, the the other point I wanted to pick up from you, uh, Francois, is you said not all member states have experience in patient involvement in HDA, and that is uh, very very true. And if you if we look at the already published implementation act. Um, when it's about stakeholder involvement, there is a lot, a lot of may and could uh, in, in the formulations. And one interpretation could be that, well, maybe, maybe not. If somebody doesn't have the competence or experience to involve patients or clinical stakeholders, maybe they just don't do it. Um, Mariana, any, any response to that? Uh, 
Yes, so um, I really think that uh, HCA doers uh, will use this opportunity because it uh, it's clearly stated in the, in the implementing act on joint clinical assessment that uh, at any time during the preparation of uh, draft assessment summary reports uh, whole process, um, HCA doers could ask. Uh, uh, patients, uh, clinicians, uh, and other experts. And also at any time during this process, uh, they may seek input uh, on disease and therapeutic area from patient organizations. So I I really hope that HA doers will uh, do that. Okay. Because it's Me important. We, we saw already during the UNETA joint actions, we, we see how this is uh, important. And uh, related to uh, uh, expertise, patient uh, involvement in uh, Western and sea uh, countries, uh, Francois mentioned uh, really uh, different barriers. So uh, sea countries, for example, involvement of, pa in, of patients in uh, their national process it's maybe not sustainable. Um, also, patients uh, need education on 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 basic um, aspects on HTA, how to be properly involved, and also I think a major barrier could be also English language. So if we could not provide opportunity, because not all patients. Uh, 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 really good uh, in, in uh, English language and if uh, they could provide uh, their uh, uh, inputs only through English it could be also a huge barrier so we have experience at the during UNETA uh, joint actions so we involved uh, the different patients even even uh, children with their parents but uh, we provided all questions uh, we translated from the English language to Croatian language, and then all, uh, uh, finally translated their responses from Croatian language to English language to be uh, accessible uh, at uh, this published uh, joint report. So I think this is important, and uh, it's also uh, important uh, uh, to point that this continuous education of patients, of uh, clinicians, are really needed uh, for proper involvement at uh, European and also at uh, national level, I think. Thank you. Thank you. So upskilling on all levels, HDA yes. agencies will learn to do this better. And also we need to educate the people who are involved to, to be able to be involved effectively, basically. Yes, and this education need to be continuous, you know, because, <laughs> uh, in the language as, as of as now said. nothing is written in a stone so uh, uh, this could be changed and a methodology will be changed and uh, uh, the changes will be needed so we all need continuous education on everything thank you so robin I, for the involvement of the clinical stakeholders how do you see that well we are looking in the in the UHTA at joint clinical assessments and joint scientific uh, consultations. So obviously, the involvement of of clinicians is uh, is super important. Um, I think if we for UHTA to be a success, what we need is um, joint assessment reports that are of high quality, that are uh, credible, that are transparent, um, and that will really you know be 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 good and, and, and strong uh, enough uh, to see the uptake and have the impact at the national level um, that will really make uh, EUHTA to have a substantial impact on, on uh, access decision-making. Um, and involving clinicians um, in the HTA regulation um, is foreseen, but mostly um, at the individual level. Uh, in the joint scientific consultations and the joint clinical assessments for uh, medical societies and other stakeholder organizations, including patient organizations, the regulation itself um, only foresees a role um, at a more general uh, level, providing input on methodologies and guidance, etc. Um, I think we have already made a lot of pro 
progress in these discussions uh, in the HTA stakeholder network uh, with the HTA bodies, with the European Commission. And uh, we saw that the recently adopted uh, implementing act on the joint clinical assessments um, already um, creates more room for involvement uh, of, of organizations, stakeholder organizations, medical societies, patient organizations, etc., in the um, uh, joint scientific consultations and the joint clinical assessments. What is really, really important is that involvement of experts will be substantial and early, um, uh, so, and structural. So not only when the process is already well underway, the PICO have been formulated, uh, uh, everything has been thought out. Um, no, it's very important that, that clinicians will be able to uh, be involved already at the early stages of the joint scientific consultations uh, so that their input can be taken into account in uh, designing uh, clinical trials, uh, formulating PICO, etc. I think that is very, very important. Medical societies have a key role in helping to identify uh, the best experts. Um, there are a lot of clinicians in Europe. They all have their own uh, specialties, uh, especially for rare and ultra rare diseases. There are often just very few experts, top experts in all of Europe. Um, it's very important, therefore, that um, the European medical societies are being consulted uh, because they have the overview on where the best uh, experts can be found. Um, and in addition, um, a, a very the added value of medical societies is also in ensure, ensuring that the input from individual experts um, is well grounded, if you will, in uh, the collective uh, expertise building that happens through medical societies, uh, scientific expert groups, uh, guideline panels, um, et cetera. Um, I, I think that is really where, where medical societies as, as organizations can help add a lot of value to the, to the process. And so a key question, of course, will, will be, you know, if that, that involvement will also be practically possible. Perhaps you can add a little bit on are the clinical stakeholders prepared to give input or because we mentioned there is training opportunities and the need for training for patients. Uh, we talked about language, which pro should probably be adapted for patients in terms of the national language, but also in terms of understandable. How, how prepared are the clinicians? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I Training uh, is important, but as Mirjana already alluded to, training can only be provided once everything is clear. Once it's clear how it uh, everything will will work, um, but just as important, and of course we see an important uh, role there for ourselves as as medical societies in helping helping to educate our clinicians about uh, EUHDA. Why is it important? Why is your uh, involvement important? Our bigger concerns at the moment are on some of the practical obstacles uh, to involving uh, clinicians because we can all design a wonderful system that looks wonderful on paper. We can start training our clinicians, but then when there are practical obstacles that prevent their actual involvement or substantial involvement, uh, the system will not be a success. I think that is very important to, to realize. Um, when I talk about practical obstacles, uh, I see three primarily. One uh, is how conflict of interest uh, policies are applied. Uh, conflict of interest is very important, uh, but conflicts of interest need to be managed rather than trying to ban them, which often uh, is, is not possible. Uh, timelines, um, clinicians treat patients, lead studies, teach at university, volunteer for societies. And then they will be asked, often at short notice, to invest substantial time in helping with uh, a joint assessment. Um, and... Um, so it, what we are not saying is the, the process should be slower. We are, are all hoping that joint HTA will help speed up access rather than delay it. 
but it will be crucially important that medical societies um, are informed as early as possible about which assessments are coming up so that we can start uh, getting ready for um, identifying and involving the right experts. Um, okay. Finally, very important collaboration by the employers of the clinicians. So the, the hospitals, uh, the, the, the universities. Um, as it currently stands, clinicians' involvement in HTA is not generally encouraged uh, by their employers. Um, so, so that is also very important that that the uh, the, the leaders at uh, academic hospitals and at universities that they understand the importance of EUHTA um, and will facilitate uh, and encourage the involvement of their their experts in in the process. Thank you, Robin. I, I think the early knowledge about what is coming, that's important for everyone in, in this game. I mean, for patient organizations, it's also, as, as Francois already pointed out, it's very important to start early to prepare for that. We have two questions which we probably could combine and, and ask Francois about. The first one is um, how the HTA regulation impacts the involvement uh, of patients and clinicians in rare and ultra and ultra rare diseases, and and then about the role of of European umbrella groups. So in in brief, um, there are there aren't specific measures for rare and ultra rare diseases. So we know there will be an additional difficulty because in parallel, we need to identify patients to be consulted by the CHMP when evaluating medicines. And often um, these will be the same people who will be invited to, to, uh, to join the HTA procedures. And they will have to work in parallel on these two, uh, which will be very demanding and sometimes confusing because the data will be more or less the same, uh, but the questions will be different. So that, that, that may be confusing and we may have difficulties to really make it clear, explaining them clearly. What, what, what is their expected contribution there and in this other uh, procedure? But that's, uh, that's our work, that's our problem. It's not their problem. Um, for, for the organizations, I think we, we could distinguish um, the the role of organizations, the patients as experts focusing on product related issues when organizations should have more um, a kind of more helicopter view uh, to see what what hole we could have to make this cooperation a success and establish working groups as already proposed exactly like we did at the EMA back in 2002 when we proposed for us as patient organizations some specific actions, for example, uh, what do we expect in terms of transparency? What, what can be improved? What can be done to make this cooperation fully transparent? Or uh, the, the reports which will be published, there will be a summary for a larger public. Uh, do we want to contribute to the template of that summary? and to teach, to train the HTA assessors to populate the template so that the lay summaries uh, are accessible to a larger public. There are such other roles, more general, uh, more broad, across the cooperation that the organizations themselves could, uh, could propose. But for rare and ultra rare diseases, we know the difficulties will be to identify the, the experts, exactly the same difficulties we are having already at the EMA, and one more uh, about medical devices, and that's a difficulty for all, but even more for rare conditions. Um, it's how the devices are proposed, and it's not on a by indication basis. For example, if we consider uh, a product, a device, or a surgery for esophageal, esophage atresia, this is not related, connected to a given disease. It can affect different people with different syndromes and abnormalities. And our organizations, I don't think we are ready to identify possible experts, uh, patients who have this symptom, this anatomical defect, or this other abnormality for which a medical device is, uh, is evaluated. So they, they, we, we need to brainstorm on how to organize 
the search for patients uh, for medical devices based on different tools. Thank you. If, if I think about the area of, of rare diseases and patient involvement, then conflict of interest comes into my mind because there are not many patients and often they've been involved already in the development and how do we deal with that? So let's perhaps talk a little bit about conflict of interest. As I mentioned before, the current guidance um, for which the consultation period ended, ends today in the evening. Uh, so if anybody still wants to contribute to that, uh, you have a few hours time. Um, it's, it seems to be very strict. What, does that, is that building trust? What's, what's your opinion on, uh, on that? Maybe we start with Mihai. So I would say that, yeah, our view is that it is quite strict at the moment. Um, I would say that coming back to, to Francois and to, to Robin's point, it doesn't look like it's very welcoming for patient and clinician involvement. So it, I, I fear that at this point in time, it's probably an additional barrier for people that are interested in, in participating and, and contributing, but they might uh, see this and already be disappointed that they don't even have the chance to try. So there's one element there. Um, it does, so to, also to Robin's point, our view is also that participating expert contribution in this process should be encouraged and if there are conflicts potential conflicts they should be this well described and made transparent we believe that the principle is more on the focus should be on expert inclusion rather than on their exclusion so with, by that we mean that the the expertise has to be involved and if there are conflicts they need to be characterized and and, and made transparent um and then maybe lastly to say that, yeah, it's 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 the last thing to to say is that the current draft implementing act has this annex number two, which has a sort of a decision make matrix. To us, it feels when we saw it the very first time, it felt that uh, having that in a secondary legislation is not really the the best. Uh, instrument because it's very narrow, it's very restrictive, it's as a straitjacket, and the bar for modifying an implementing act is much is quite high. So especially with a new process, it feels to us that it's probably better to have such a decision, even if we do agree that a decision matrix is is good or not, that's a separate conversation. But having such a restrictive instrument in a, in a secondary legislation is probably not a good idea, especially with a new system that will most likely need to learn from its first experiences. So we would have much more preferred this to be in a, in a guidance, a coordination group guidance, or some other type of document that can be much more easily amended within six months or 12 months or whatever. We, wherever we see that it's not really uh, working as we intended. Any, any additional comments from the other? Robin, I see you lean and leaning forward. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I, I think um, what Mihai mentions is, is quite important. I, I would say that the the there's the principles and there's how you apply them and i think we can all agree that uh, a clear and, and transparent uh a policy on on conflicts of interest is is necessary um and i, I don't think you you will not find a single doctor you know who who will deny the importance of having a, a clear conflict of interest uh, policy but then there's also the reality uh, and especially in rare and ultra rare diseases, um, uh, doctors without competing interest simply do not exist. So then you can do things. Either you involve secondary uh, or semi-experts, uh, which will go at the expense of the um, uh, assessments. No one wants that. Um, so you will need to find a way pragmatically on a case-by-case -case basis with uh, some flexibility and importantly, full transparency uh, to involve the best available experts. 
um, that is in the interest of, of everyone, ultimately, certainly in the interest of, of patients and of improving uh, access. Um, so we can agree on, on relatively uh, strict principles, but there needs to be a room for pragmatic and flexible interpretation. I think that is, and uh, yes, gui I agree with Mihai, guidance uh, documents here are uh, the, the, the most obvious instrument. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, it's also important to consider that there are no decisions made on the EU clinical assessment level, and and therefore the impact of a potential conflict of interest is really relatively the risk is relatively low because uh, there is no decision made. So it's basically only the input given by the stakeholders. And therefore, I think the conflict of interest regulation should be adapted to that. Uh, Francois, I, I see your hand up. Just to say quickly that the, the implementing act on conflict of interest, uh, I think, is not that bad. We, we need rules. There are rules. And there is also flexibility, particularly for rare uh, conditions where experts are difficult to find. And we have the experience by UNETA where no expert, no external expert was rejected these last years uh, due to conflict of interest, including situations where they balanced uh, the conflicts some had with the need to have an expert at the table. And in all cases, they decided to have the experts at, uh, at the table. So I think we hope they will continue with this uh, mindset. Uh, this said, I think, it's important even for consultations, even for non-decision-making evaluations. It's clear that HTA are closer to payers and there, there is a lot of sensitivity here on people who are under the influence. And not all pharmaceutical companies have uh, um, these practices, but some have practices where clearly uh, they go too far in trying to influence and not respecting the independence of external experts or, and patients. And even if it's only a minority of them, it's so obvious to HTA experts, for example, when they hear a patient representative using the exact same words than someone a company they saw the day before, it creates a, um, an environment, an atmosphere, which is not based uh, on trust and what we what we would need. So uh, I think for this cooperation to work and for all experts to contribute, we also need to convince industry to respect the independence of experts, not trying to influence them. We still hear uh, some companies saying when they attend meetings of patients, we're here to, to see who our assets are and in which patient representative we need to invest to represent our interest at EMA or elsewhere. So there, there, there is this tendency that we really need to, to abolish uh, in, in some because one or two may have detrimental effects on, uh, on all. Can I add one important uh, comment? Uh, on Go ahead. Um, I agree with uh, Francois that the implementing act is actually not so bad with a uh, few small modifications. Uh, I think as a basis, um, it, it will do just fine. It's really about how it is uh, applied uh, in situations where um, uh, there are no experts without competing interest. Um, our experience, and that's something I think I should mention with the UNETA Joint Action 3 uh, assessments um, in hematology is, however, that, that many experts were only very partially or not at all involved because of uh, rigid interpretation of their conflicts of interest. So we do see a real danger there. Also in discouraging right, uh, clinicians from contributing to and helping to make the system a success. Because when you go through all the, the administrative burdens of declaration of interest, which we hope will be harmonized with, with EMA, by the way, um, and then, you know, ultimately you're excluded uh, from uh, the, the assessment or you're only being asked to invite uh, to, to answer some very general uh, questions. Um, that is not exactly an encouragement uh, to 
you know, be make yourself available on a next occasion. May mm -hmm. I? May I just a quick response? Yeah, very, very short, because I would like to slowly go, go on. With it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So HDA doors uh, 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 have a chance to uh, use uh, the patients and clinical experts with conflict of interest, so it's stated, and uh, HDA doers know how to deal with uh, such conflict, and as uh, uh, all uh, say said uh, the transparency is the most important thing, and we uh, did it in the United Joint Action transparently. Uh, wrote that in a uh, report. So I think we need to be pragmatic because of short uh, timelines, and uh, I think it will be good. Thank you. Thank you, Mayana. Maybe very, very briefly to François and to Mihai, how can both of your members or organizations help to, let's say, navigate uh, the conflict of interest? Because we said there is a risk that um, uh, the, the patients have been involved before in the development, actually also for the clinical side. Uh, but they would all should also be involved in HDA, and and now we've heard industry should be careful in how they involve patients. Maybe a very quickly a statement around how we can we to work together to improve the situation. Who wants to start? Mihai, uh, I, I can go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Francois. No, I can I can go I can go first and say that. Um, I think, unfortunately, as with all the other implementing arrangements of the HDA regulation, right now we are still in a theoretical environment. Um, we're waiting. I probably we will reach soon a situation where we will, will only have to rely on the practice to be able to understand exactly the implications of the the, the process. Um, I agree as well with Francois that in in Joint Action Three there weren't any situations where where. Uh, outside well, patient or clinician expertise was uh, was uh, automatically rejected. We also hope this will remain the case in, in, in the future. So it's really about how the principles outlined in the Implementing Act will actually be uh, applied and who makes those uh, those decisions. I would add to that that maybe one thing that is to my view missing right now and would greatly help also in the in the future we don't yet have a clear visibility as to how the patient and clinician involvement and input will actually be captured in the final assessment report, just to be able to have that feedback mechanism so that this type of engagement can be made better in future assessments. So we don't, I'm not sure that we have uh, an output from the the input of the of the patients and, and clinicians contribution into the into the process so that would i would say would help a lot both i think i would have, it would help everybody so the htd and the hd bodies and the respective uh community that provided that that input to get better at the next assessment and the next assessment and the next assessment so i think we also need to think about how Everything that we do will not stop in 2025. In 2025, will be only the beginning, and we need to also be create already the mechanisms that will help us to make 2026 better than 2025 and 2027 better than 2026. Any any comment from Francois or Robin? Just to say that we've seen groups of patients, for example, in community advisory board, who meet with all developers in their field over the years, and they follow the research, and um, nothing prevented them of engaging, at least with regulators, even in writing, when they have questions, concerns, or suggestions on how to improve a clinical trial when a scientific advice meeting is planned ahead. Uh, there, there are ways to uh, to enter in contact with uh, with regulators, and e even if you are frequently discussing the the, the product, um, again, it has to do with transparency. When the minutes are published and when 
uh, it's, a call, it's a group of patients, more difficult to influence than just one single individual. And what matters are the current interests. So if in the past, and that remains to be defined precisely, if in the past you had contacts, but uh, since the, for the last three years, this contact stopped, uh, then it's not the same than if you met with the company just the week before the, the procedure uh, started. So there, there, there are case studies to, uh, to share but with patient organizations to uh, learn uh, how patients can both provide advice to developers and be consulted by regulators and HTA. And um, even if sometimes the, we have to accept some restrictions, but something we absolutely want to avoid is the tendency HTA have to use questionnaires to uh, involve people they think have too much conflict of interest. A questionnaire is what you use when you don't want to be engaged, uh, when you want to engage with a, a third party. And um, they're not at all a satisfying method uh, to consult with uh, any third party. Thank you. Yeah, Robin. Yes, uh, the, interestingly, at the last HTA stakeholder network meeting, uh, I helped lead a, a, a discussion, breakout discussions on the joint scientific consultations. And part of that was a question to the participants um, what they uh, would prefer as method to be consulted, questionnaires or interviews. And whereas on patient side, I think the, the majority um, uh, prefers interviews, uh, that's actually different on the side of doctors because they uh, generally will be providing their input at 11 o'clock at night, uh, and then it's easier to do via a questionnaire than uh, an interview. Uh, this was not everyone's opinion, but but quite a few of them. So I, I think here too, um, fit for purpose is more, um, is better than, than uh, one size fits all. Pragmatism. Great, that's that's a good note. I see a, here are some positive signs here, are positive assumptions here. This is good. Let's turn a little bit to to the methods in the end. Um, I, there, there are two issues: is the timelines, and we've talked already a little bit uh, around the timelines, and and then this the scoping phase, the picos. My Mariana, perhaps. Can you explain again, like what this Pico thing is, and um, and uh, the potential challenges in there from the HTA side? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, the Pico is very important for uh, HTA doers, but also for for uh, <laughs> uh, patient and and uh, clinicians. Uh, so as HTA doers, uh, we have this uh, Pico framework uh, uh, as a standard format for definition of research questions. So this is the really uh, uh, putting the, the, the scope of uh, our assessment and it, it is uh, obviously uh, with, uh, of huge importance and PICO is uh, um, abbreviation related to the patient population or subgroup subpopulation uh, to the intervention we assessed uh, to the comparator intervention could be uh, uh, pharmaceutical, could be medical devices. So it's really depend, could be standard of care. Uh, uh, and uh, very important outcomes. So it's really important that we also include the patient uh, important uh, outcomes like uh, quality of life, like uh, patient satisfaction, also uh, uh, clinician satisfaction, for example, if we are doing uh, uh, assessment on medical devices. And uh, as we have uh, 27 member states, uh, um, it could be really important uh, how many PICOs uh, we will have because members uh, need to, to provide their input on, on uh, patient population, on comparison, on outcomes. And uh, um, in different exercises, we already see that uh, the main differences between member states related uh, to the comparators and um, also patient population because uh, some member states uh, um, relied on the, this uh, whole population. Some member states uh, uh, preferred uh, some subpopulations. So we will see in practice uh, 
how we will manage that, uh, how many picos will be there. But uh, we need to, uh, so we need to be pragmatic. Uh, what is really doable, uh, because uh, uh, we have this pool ex uh, expertise and uh, we need to be prepared for many uh, picos and the methodology is there for indirect comparison, network meta-analysis, etc. But we also need to have in mind if uh, member states are not satisfied with the PICO, so uh, they will not be satisfied with the joint assessment, and then they will provide the uh, duplication at national level. So they will start uh, from the scratch. So uh, we need to be pragmatic, but uh, also have in mind this uh, important issue that uh, member states uh, need to be satisfied with the PICO framework and uh, with the uh, uh, scientific evidence to be able to uh, put it in a national uh, HDA process. Thank you. Mihai, from your perspective, I mean, your members before they had like 27 PICOs to respond to. It should be an improvement now. So I think that it should be an improvement, but it does require uh, a willingness to change how things are done right now. I think it is true that this, the, the, the requirements at national level were still very fragmented. The, only, the difference was that companies had the opportunity to meet them over a longer period of time. I think what happens now with the HTA regulation is that the timeline is reduced, but if it doesn't come with a, a, a certain reduction as well in the, the workload and the, the number of analysis and so on, I think there's a risk to the quality of the, the outputs of the JCA report itself. This is not only a problem also for the HTD because they have, that they have to prepare a, a big dossier and everything like that, but it's also for the assessors. Somebody will have to do still the assessment of the evidence on, on, on the table. So the increased number of, uh, of PICOs, there has to be a balance found, and it's a delicate balance to find somewhere between the, the, the scope, the size of the, the, JCA, the, the JCA dossier and report, and the feasibility of making of creating a, a, an excellent quality output within the mandated timelines. So that's where uh, the the challenge of finding uh, the appropriate scope is is uh, is uh, uh, most uh, acute. I would also say that the opportunity is there if we think of the European system as creating the report that streamlines the needs of member states that are in common, but leaves the possibility of, let's say, exceptional data requirements that are specific only for a certain country or only for a certain situation to be dealt with in that specific context, rather than overloading the European system just to be sure that everybody captures all of their, sorry, that the system captures and characterizes the needs of, uh, of all member states. So that's for us, the, the balance between the timeline, the completeness, and the quality of the assessment. Okay, great, thank you. Um, maybe as, as a summary from everything I heard, it's kind of like, yeah, this is positive. It may speed up processes. Uh, there, there are good regulations in a way, but we need to make them work in reality. Um, uh, so positive expectations, but also some challenges I hear, timelines, PCOs, uh, and so on. If we look forward, um, I, I, the, the, it is said that over like three or four years, there should be a revision uh, uh, of of the guidance and and how this works based on the experience. What what are your expectations towards uh, where should we be and how should that work uh, in in uh, in this revision? Um, maybe I start with Nayana. Yes. So uh, 
especially from scientific point of view, nothing is written in stone. We know that uh, methodology processes are evolving. Uh, so uh, we need to be pragmatic. And when the, the new methods uh, are there, we should uh, change uh, the guidelines and uh, also uh, we probably in the near future, we need to rely also on real world evidence, how to handle the single art trials. So everything uh, uh, possible uh, needed, uh, any change uh, will uh, uh, to be adopt uh, adopted as, as soon as possible, because uh, we know that our decision makers at national level need uh, evidence, need the uh, transparency of this, and. Uh, how to also cope with some uh, 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 yeah uncertainties, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Mihai. From so I'm still a I'm still a firm believe, believer in the HDA regulation. I think it makes a lot of sense to to pull together the resources and to do this clinical assessment once at European level. Uh, while leaving the, the 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 rest of the complicated decisions at at national level, I would say that it is more likely than not that 2025 will be rather painful for everybody involved. I think it's it's yeah it's a new system, it's a new way of doing things. Uh, there will likely be gro growing pains, and I think what's important for for all of us is to also consider what are the mechanisms that we can put in place so that we can learn from the experience of the first assessments to make the subsequent assessments better. I know that there is a legal requirement for the European Commission to undertake a revision in 2028, so three years afterwards, but I think there is ample opportunity for us as a, as a stakeholder collective, via yeah, the stakeholder network or other uh, forums and, and platforms to not to wait until 2028 to articulate the need for for specific process or methods or or whatever changes that we see from from the experience i think it's important yeah it's important that we we ensure that we set the future system on a on a positive feedback loop and that each system each assessment is is better than the the previous one thank you very much and robin Yes, I, uh, on balance, I am uh, positive uh, as well. Um, and, um, you know, if, if only just looking at the fact that um, there is broad acknowledgement uh, at the moment, I really see that in, in, in all corners, uh, HTA bodies, uh, bodies uh, European Commission, all stakeholders involved, uh, broad acknowledgement of the importance of involvement of patient experts um, and, and clinical experts. Um, and, and ultimately, um, whether it will be a success will depend on whether the implementation happens with, you know, in the spirit of harmonization, real harmonization, because if all uh, HTA bodies at the national level uh, stick to their old ways of, of doing, then, you know, it's not going to be a uh, success. Um, but harmonization and, you know, doing this together is really the only way uh, to improving uh, access um, and, and decision-making about access. Great. Francois, the last comment for you. Well, something we haven't discussed a lot is the voluntary cooperation that is part of this cooperation, um, where there is already one interest group with nine member states and they are willing, I understand, I don't know much, to go beyond what the European report will say and work together to maybe work more clearly on a conclusion on, a, on the new technology, which is interesting. And they're also willing to assess the economic aspects, at least to discuss the different economic methods uh, that can be applied. There are other corporations that already exist, like Benelux R, or Finose, or the Lavalette Declaration, or some research projects in HTA, like the HTX projects. So there are, in parallel to the HTA cooperation, there are other corporations, more on a voluntary basis, which are extremely useful. Um, they act as different models to complete the work of the uh, European cooperation set by the regulation. And, and we hope that both levels can articulate and enrich uh, each other uh, to fill the gap and to propose new ways 
and to plan ahead, see uh, what works well and what the EU could build on in the in the next years. Uh, agreeing that the beginning will be difficult, that there will be more technologies uh, to assess than they think. There, the need for scientific consultations will be much higher than uh, what they can do the first years, but we will see how the uh, the resources will uh, will evolve to follow the the demand and uh, and the work that needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you uh, for the great discussion. I, I I feel we could have continued, but I think time is limited. And uh, thank you also for the audience for the questions that came in. And with that, I give back to Monica. Thank you, Anki. Um, thank you so much to everyone. Um, certainly a lot of food for thought based on the views expressed today on um, various aspects of the health technology assessment regulation on implementation, patient and clinician views, conflict of interest, um, process of methods. Uh, may I uh, please remind everyone that um, we have recorded this, um, uh, this webinar and um, in a few days, you will be able to see it on the MP and Allen websites, as well as uh, social media channels. So please keep an eye on it. Um, and a heartfelt thank you to um, all our experts today, uh, panelists and, uh, and a wonderful moderator. Thank you so much for your views. Thank you so much for your time and insights. Um, a good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>